In this video, we'll be discussing how to decode a GIT case history. So we have a 40-year-old male who presented with chief complaints of yellow discoloration of eyes and skin since one year, abdominal distension since eight months, and pedalema since four months. So the history of present illness is the patient presented with yellowish discoloration of eyes and skin since one year, which was noticed by his wife initially in the eyes and then it gradually progressed to the whole body. It is associated with anorexia and nausea, but it is not associated with itching, pale colored stools, foul smelling, difficult to flush stools, high colored urine, cola colored urine, and multiple blood transfusions. So, as the, the patient has yellowish discoloration, it can be present either due to hyperkeratinemia or it can be due to jaundice. But hyperkeratinemia is absent in eyes, whereas jaundice initially appears in the eyes. So as there is history that the initial notice was in eyes and it was followed by to the whole body, it suggests that this is probably not a case of hyperkeratinemia and this is a case of jaundice. Now as the patient has jaundice, it can be due to prehepatic cause, hepatic cause or a post-hepatic cause. The prehepatic cause occurs most commonly due to hemolysis and in that case there will be color colored urine present and there might be history of multiple blood, blood transfusions with both of which are absent in this case. Another can be a post hepatic cause in which there will be itching present, there will be pale colored stools present, there will be foul smelling difficult to flush stools and there will be high colored urine present which all of which are absent in this case. And in case of hepatic jaundice usually there is associated anorexia and nausea present which are characteristic of a hepatic cause. So from this HOPI we can decode that this is probably a case of hepatic jaundice. Next is the patient has abdominal distension since 8 months and it is it was in serious in onset and has been gradually progressive since then and the distension is uniform and there is no history of associated non passage of stools and flatus. So whenever a patient comes with abdominal distension it can be due to 6 F's it can be due to fluid accumulation due to feces or flatus accumulation can be due to a fetus can be due to a fatal lump or can be due to fat. Now in case of feces and flatus there will be history of non passage of stools and flatus which is absent in this case. Also as this is a male this is less likely to be a fetus and in case of a fatal lump usually it is arising from an organ so usually the distension is non uniform that is it will be arising from a part of abdomen not from the whole abdomen as uniform. So this is less likely to be a fatal lump. So the most likely is the fluid. Another reason for abdominal distension can be due to acute hemorrhage, pancreatitis or a paralytic ileus. But these are acute causes and will present with acute onset. Whereas in this case there is an insidious onset and which is gradually progressive. So this abdominal distension is probably due to fluid. So the probably the patient has ascites which also uh, correlates with the hepatic jaundice that the patient has. And followed by ascites the patient developed pedal edema which was in serious onset, gradually progressive, was bilateral, was present up to the knees and the straps of slippers imprinted on the swelling. The pedal edema is less in the morning and progresses as the day progresses, but it is not associated with chest pain, palpitation, syncope, periorbital edema, frothy urine, diarrhea, malnutrition or shortness of breath and there is no history of associated redness or pain in the limbs. So whenever the patient presents with a limb swelling, it can be due to many causes. The first we have to look out whether it is unilateral or bilateral. The, like this, in this case it is bilateral. The causes like cellulitis and DVT are usually unilateral. Whereas the causes like congestive heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, CLD, uh, protein losing entropathy, malnutrition, hypothyroidism are usually bilateral. So the first is we have to know uh, it, whether it is unilateral or bilateral. The second we should know the extent up to which extent it is present to know the severity. Once we have come to know this next we have to know whether it is pitting or non-pitting because in case of hypothyroidism it will be non-pitting whereas in case in these causes it will be pitting. So how do we ask for pitting? We ask if when the patient uh, wears the slippers are the straps imprinted on the swelling so as in this case it is present it is probably a bilateral type of pitting edema now the bilateral type of pitting edema can be present in case of chf 
nephrotic syndrome cld or protein losing enteropathy in case of chf the patient initially has pedal edema followed by ascites occurs and then followed by nsrk occurs whereas in cases of nephrotic syndrome initially the patient has periorbital edema and it is followed by the whole body swelling that is the nsrk whereas in cases of cld initially the ascites develops followed by the pedal edema and followed by the nsrk whereas in the protein losing enteropathy the pattern is similar to the nephrotic syndrome so in this case the patient initially had ascites and it is followed by pedal edema and the pedal edema is less in the morning and it is not associated with chest pain palpitation and syncope so it rules out that it is not due to chf there is no history of associated periorbital edema so it is and also frothurin so it is less likely to be nephrotic there is no associated diarrhea so it is less likely to be protein losing enteropathy there is no history of malnutrition present so it is le less likely to be due to malnutrition so in this case the limb edema is probably due to cld because initially the ascites is occurring followed by the pedal edema is occurring and it is bilateral and it is spitting so based on this hopi we can come to know that the patient has a hepatic type of jaundice followed by the abdominal distension is present which is probably fluid and it is probably ascites and which was followed by pedal edema that is probably due to cld so the uh, from the this much history we can probably get to know that this is probably a case of cld or it can be due to post hepatic portal hypertension it cannot be a pre hepatic portal hypertension because in pre hepatic portal hypertension jaundice is absent whereas in this case jaundice is present so it can either be cld or there can be a post hepatic portal hypertension which has led to congestion of the liver followed by jaundice and due to portal hypertension there is developing ascites followed by the pedal edema okay and the post hepatic portal hypertension can occur either due to budgeary syndrome can occur due to ivc webs can occur due to ascites precox in case of budgeary syndrome there will be associated abdominal pain present in case of ivc uh, in case of uh, ascites precox there will be associated uh, distended neck veins present as it occurs due to constrictive pericarditis but as these are not present in our history so probable case according to the history is cld so the case we have come to know that probably it is a chronic liver disease now we will uh, try to understand the cause of this cld so for this we will ask other histories in the history of presenting in us like i have asked whether there is there whether there is history of fever preceding jaundice present or there is history of any blood transfusion needle prick injury iv drug abuse tattooing high risk sexual behavior any skin lesions or joint pains as all these can be present in case of hep b and hep c so this is absent in this case then i have asked the history whether there is history of recurrent attacks of such, such jaundice or there is associated hypothyroidism or type 1 diabetes these type of history present in autoimmune hepatitis in which usually there are more than one attacks present and usually other autoimmune disorders are also present like associated uh, hypothyroidism can be present or autoimmune disorder causing type 1 diabetes can be present then i have asked history whether the patient has history of uh, steroid intake or the patient is obese or the patient has history of any deranged lipid profile all of which can lead to non alcoholic fatty liver disease but all of these are absent in this case again for the congenital causes i have asked if there is any grayish discoloration of the skin the associated joint pain is has the this does the patient has infertility or the patient has diabetes or the patient has abnormal body movements or the patient has, is has any psychiatric disorder or the patient is taking any herbal medications or the patient is taking any alcohol intake so these history and these history have been done to check out uh, the congenital co causes that is the hemochromatosis and wilson the herbal medicines can itself be a cause of cld so they have been ruled out and also the alcohol intake is very important as alcoholic liver disease is very common in india and in this case i could found that the patient was taking alcohol about 80 g per day and he was taking it about for 15 years okay it is very important to know how much amount uh, per day the patient is taking and for how many years because it has been seen that uh, taking more than 40 to 80 g alcohol per day for more than 
टेन टू ट्वेंटी ईयर्स इज रिक्वायर्ड टू कॉल ए सी एल डी टू कॉज सी एल डी सो द अमाउंट एंड द ईयर्स इज़ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इफ द पेशेंट इज़ एल्कोहलिक सो विद दिस हिस्ट्री वी हैव कम टू नो दैट दिस इज़ प्रोबेबली अ केस ऑफ एल्कोहलिक लिवर डिजीज एंड विच इज़ क्रॉनिक वाई क्रॉनिक बिकॉज द सिम्टम्स आर प्रेजेंट फॉर मोर देन सिक्स मंथ्स to know what is the case and what is the complication we next we have to check if the patient has any complication secondary to cld secondary to cld there can be two type of complication what can be uh, one can be due to decreased liver function that is there can be symptoms and signs of liver failure and second can be due to cirrhosis causing occ- occlusion of the sinusoids which will lead to symptoms of portal hypertension so once we have come to know it this is a case of alcoholic liver disease we need to find out whether there are any symptoms of liver failure and whether the portal hypertension has developed in this patient because the management will depend on that now in case of liver failure as there will be decreased coagulation factors production and decreased vitamin k absorption in that there will be bleeding tendencies present also as there will be decreased conversion of ammonia to urea there will be hepatic encephalopathy present in which there will be altered sleep cycle altered sensorium the patient will become drowsy and may go into coma as there will be decreased metabolism of the uh, estrogen there can be infertility present now uh, as the liver function is decreased the no present in the blood cannot be metabolized so this no increases in the blood and these lead to splanchnic vasodilation as the splanchnic vasodilation occurs the blood to the kidney decreases and leads to hepatorenal syndrome in which case there will be decreased urine output so the this history of decreased urine output is very very important and also due to increased no there will be opening of the arteriovenous shunts in the pulmonary circulation and this leads to platypnea the that is the hepatopulmonary syndrome <coughs> so these all are the history that you need to evaluate if the patient has liver failure or not now the portal hypertension what happens due to portal hypertension one there is increased pressure in the splenic vein and this leads to splenomegaly which can then lead to hypersplenism in which there will be decreased rbcs decreased platelets and decreased wbcs the decreased platelets will increase Uh, again lead to bleeding tendencies and decreased wbcs will lead to recurrent infection so i will have to ask whether the patient has recurrent infection or not and whether due to splenomegaly the patient has left upper quadrant dragging sensation or not also due to portal hypertension there will be dilation of the porto cavall anastomosis which can lead to dilation of the esophageal varices as well as the rectal varices due to esophageal varices dilation there can be hematemesis and melina present whereas due to rectal varices dilation there can be fresh rectal blood uh, present a history of both of it should be asked also due to portal hypertension ascites will develop which is present in this case the, so probably the portal hypertension is developed but portal hyper, uh, the ascites can also occur due to low protein due to decreased production by the liver okay so once the patient has developed ascites we need to look whether there are complications present within the ascites or not uh, example in cases of ascites uh, the pa- there is increased chances of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis which has to be measured aggr- uh, which has to be treated aggressively in and in that case there can be fever spikes present there can be abdominal pain present but it is usually Uh, less prominent so the history of fever becomes a very important part in case of cld as it may suggest that the patient has spontaneous bacterial peritonitis also secondary to ascites as abdominal pressure increases there are increased chances of hernia and the scrotal edema can occur which has increased chances of infection so the history of any abdominal swelling increasing on coughing that is the hernia and the history of any scrotal swelling is also important so this is how you take a history of uh, git case starting with the case then uh, history of the cause and then checking if the complications of liver failure and the portal hypertension is present or not